For many travelers, the state of Arizona is an essential part of their American Southwest journey. From its sweltering deserts to its snow-capped mountains, Arizona offers an unexpected variety of spectacular and unique places different from any other common travel routes. Arizona Hotspots introduces you to some of the most interesting places that are definitely worth a closer look. Few people know the Verde Valley by name, yet they have most likely passed it on their journeys around Arizona. As we will see in this episode of Arizona Hotspots, it may be the remoteness of Verde Valley's towns that gives each one of them their unique appearance. Only a few minutes drive west from Interstate 17, but far enough to stay mostly unnoticed, lies Sedona. Sedona's massive red rock formations set themselves apart from the rest of the Verde Valley. Sedona itself was a nameless settlement originally founded by Anglo-American farmers after different tribes of Native Americans had inhabited the area for several hundred years. The town was officially named after T.C. Schnebly's wife, Sedona, in 1902. The Postal Administration refused the name Oak Creek Crossing and Schnebly Station for its inconvenient length. Being a very popular travel destination, Sedona is mainly conceptualized as a tourist town. Its residents do a very good job to keep it looking like the photos promise. Sedona's goal is to blend in with nature as much as possible. The homes and businesses must blend in with the red rock surroundings by using hues of orangey red and other earthy colors on their facades. As a dedicated destination for tourists interested in crystals, psychics, and other new age phenomena, Sedona is a true paradise for artists and art lovers alike. As we enter the beating heart of Sedona, we locate a southwestern style open air shopping center called Talakapaki. It is a rather calm, but rarely empty, place full of artist galleries, sculptures, and fountains. As a perfect initiation for our Verde Valley tour, the various galleries give a good impression of what we can expect out on the trails. We spend hours wandering through the beautiful alleyways. We admire the talents of countless photographers and painters until we can't wait to explore Sedona's nature ourselves with our own cameras in hand. As we pass halfway through the town, we discover a very exotic looking building. In comparison to surrounding large rock formations, it appears almost unimposing. However, the Chapel of the Holy Cross is remarkable. Former local resident, rancher, and sculptor Marguerite Brunswick Stoud, who was inspired by the architecture of the Empire State Building, couldn't finish the construction of her building in Budapest, Hungary due to World War II. Instead, she decided to locate her artwork in her hometown of Sedona. The chapel was finished in 1956 after only 18 months and was recently elected as one of the seven man-made wonders of Arizona. While the back entrance is rather low, the front facade stands out quite majestically. The gigantic cross that defines the window structure rises directly from a rock which gives the chapel a monumental appearance. As we enter the church, we immediately recognize the wonderful panoramic view across the canyon. The countless trails are not only visited by spiritual individuals, but also by passionate hikers from all over the world. Although occasionally blocked due to the danger of fire hazards during the hot summer months, Sedona can provide more than 70 different hiking paths which vary in their difficulty, length, and appearance.
While some routes lead through flat plains or meandering canyons, others can be quite steep and require a higher level of fitness to climb. But the reward of astonishing panoramic views from the highest points are totally worth it. Although the long and bumpy trails may be a little too challenging for seniors and small children, Sedona provides a large selection of Jeep tours to all different places and not only delivers tourists to the most interesting destinations, but also ensures their comfort and security. For those who are interested in hiking, we have the following tips for you. Always carry enough water with you. Don't leave the trails. A map or a travel guide might become your most useful companion. Always use sun protection. If you're inexperienced with hiking, never go alone. Keep an eye on the time. The sunset happens very fast, and although you might be used to long summer days in northern places, in Arizona, the sun sets much earlier. An early sunset doesn't necessarily mean you should lock yourself in your hotel room. In fact, Sedona provides another very interesting feature for night owls, stargazing. In big cities, people rarely get to see the stars in their true beauty. Sedona meets all requirements for a dark city. Set up your camera, switch to long time exposure, and just wait for the magic to happen. About 30 miles west from Sedona, we travel uphill through the winding roadways to the former mining town of Jerome. As it is characteristic for most mining towns to be built on a slope or surrounded by rocky hills, Jerome is no exception. Even from 20 miles away, we spot the little town high up in the Black Hills mountain range. Jerome hasn't always been that small. In 1929, Jerome had over 15,000 residents and a rather wild reputation. With 12 brothels and almost 100 saloons, it had the requirements to attract thousands of mine workers into the booming city. People actually called it the wickedest city of the West. Jerome was founded in 1898 by Eugene Murray Jerome. Despite several severe mining fires and explosion-induced earthquakes, the flourishing of Jerome seemed unstoppable. The small town had grown rapidly and reached its peak in 1929. When the value of copper decreased in 1935, Phelps Dodge took over the two mines, but the Great Depression had already taken its toll on the mining industry. When the last mine closed in 1953, Jerome's population had already sunk to under 50 people, and it would become one of Arizona's countless abandoned ghost towns. Fortunately, someone had other plans. The 1970s New Age movement had attracted a great number of artists who saw the dying town of Jerome as a perfect place to live. Today's Jerome is not quite the booming heart of industry that it used to be. Instead, its residents tried to conserve its history for the numerous tourists that find their way up to Jerome every day. Surprisingly, there are still a lot of original buildings left. Although some of them no longer resemble their former structure, they live on by means of information plaques that you can find all around the town. Jerome's reputation as a ghost town isn't solely based on its near disappearance from the map in 1950. Numerous reports from different parts of the town say that it is actually haunted. The Jerome Grand Hotel hasn't always served as a vacation spot. During its peak time, it harbored injured mine workers as Jerome's only hospital. The United Verde Hospital, as it was called back then, suffered over 9,000 deaths of patients. 
During the building's time as a hospital, the grand suite on the third floor served as the surgery room. Today, the tiles on the wall serve as the last silent remnants of its former days as a sterile environment for life-altering and sometimes deadly procedures on the human body. Although there is no evidence left of the demise of the former patients, you feel a certain melancholy as you wander through the corridor of this former hospital that served so many as their last home on earth. Back on our route through Verde Valley, our next two destinations are places with confusing yet oddly familiar names. As we head further south on Interstate 17, we come to Montezuma's Castle and Montezuma's Well. But who was Montezuma and was he really here? Originally, Matekazoma, mispronounced as Moctezuma and finally completely misspelled as Montezuma, was the name of two different Aztec emperors, Montezuma I and Montezuma II, fighting against the Spanish during the 15th century. Nevertheless, the naming of these tourist attractions is a common misunderstanding that first occurred in the 1860s, when the first European Americans discovered the very old Native American ruin built inside the walls of a small canyon and mistook it for an Aztec fortress. The Aztec emperors, on the other hand, never even expanded their realm this far north. In addition, the ruins were probably abandoned at least 40 years before Montezuma I was even born. Although the misconception got cleared up, the names were kept. Today, over 400,000 tourists come here annually only to find out that Montezuma's castle is actually a five-story cliff dwelling built out of limestone and clay by the Sinagua Indians around the 11th century. This once habitable construction was supposedly built so high off the ground to avoid the monsoon flash floods. It was perfectly protected from wildlife and other intruders since it was only accessible by portable ladders. The Sanagua Indians were last seen in 1425 when their disappearance might have been caused by droughts or the depletion of resources, but most likely due to clashes with the competing tribes of the Yavapai, Mugion, Anasazi, or Hohokam Indians. In 1906, President Roosevelt declared Montezuma's castle a national monument. Despite the fact that the ruin got severely raided after its discovery, most of its structure is still well intact. In fact, it still counts as one of North America's most preserved monuments. Visitors can see the front from the outside. The ladders were removed for use by tourists in 1951 due to potential security issues. Interested tourists who want to see the internal structure of the dwelling have the possibility to see an open miniature diorama of Montezuma's castle while visiting the site. Only 11 miles away, we find yet another monument named Montezuma's Well. The well, which also belongs to the Montezuma's Castle National Monument, is a limestone sinkhole. The underground spring brings approximately 1.5 million gallons of water up to the surface every day. And although the spring water seems fresh and unpolluted, it contains high amounts of carbon dioxide and almost no oxygen, which makes the pond completely uninhabitable for fish. Nevertheless, the spring is home to at least five endemic freshwater species of animals, insects, and plants, which makes Montezuma's well a very lucrative source of nutrition for migratory birds. The well wasn't known to the general public until its mentioning in Richard J. Hinton's Handbook to Arizona, published in 1878. The first scuba expedition took place in 1948. The well's form corresponds to the typical Zanuti, a collapsed limestone bedrock cavern that reveals an underground spring. Zanutis are widespread in the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula, but a rather rare discovery in the dry desert of Arizona. But the mystery about Montezuma's well is even far more complex than it seems because its water quality shows no commonalities with any other water sources in the Verde Valley area. Its relatively warm temperature, which averages around 76 degrees Fahrenheit, keeps the surrounding environment in a consistent state. 
the well has to undergo weekly maintenance to keep rapidly growing pond weeds from occluding the outflow to the irrigation canal systems. As a matter of fact, the outflow of the well was regimented by several man-made canals since the 7th century and could easily supply a farmland of 60 acres. Almost invisible on first sight, the rim of the well is full of well-hidden cliff dwellings. These one-room buildings were once inhabited by the Sanagua Indians. The limestone huts are still intact and we get a glimpse of how the Native Americans once lived as farmers. For the Yavapai Indians, who settled the Verde Valley after the disappearance of the Sanagua, the well has a spiritual meaning. They believe that the well is the portal through which their souls emerged into this world. Visitors can walk halfway around the pond and see the huts from a close range. Due to their age and consistency, the huts should not be entered. If you look closely at the hut's walls, we discover some rather modern looking inscriptions. These inscriptions are in fact graffiti drawn by the first tourists in the late 19th century. As we leave the Verde Valley behind us, we know that we still haven't seen the majority of it. And maybe this is the reason why the Verde Valley isn't just a tourist region. With its calm, picturesque landscape, it is set in the mild center of several very different climate zones, such as the higher elevated north with its canyons, volcanoes, and forests, or the dry south with its characteristic wild west towns, spiky cacti, and tumbleweeds. In our next episode, we explore the Arizona mountain range. Don't forget your hiking boots, it's gonna be a long trek. <laughs>